They're very, very lifelong fans. They do not change. So if you're a ZSC fan, you don't change because ZSC's had a bad couple of games or a bad couple of years. It's in your blood and you keep it, uh, you keep it there forever. And they support you through uh, thick and thin. <laughs> whistle but mostly they they sing and they chant and you you have to know all those things if you're going to be a fan of the team in every every organization they've got their battle cries and you've got to be invested to be a fan over here It feels very good. The Dutch Spielers spilled very good for the playoffs. Hey, uh, uh, I'm very happy, very happy, very happy for them. It's so wonderful to see all these young guys and all these veteran players, just how happy they are to win. And uh, you know, it's been a long time since I've won, uh, but again, uh, you know, I realize now how much importance there is to be a player and to win. I've studied that team quite a bit just because I, I like history and I, I like the history of, uh, of the McFarlands and you know, I've talked to my dad a lot about what made that team special and, and why they were good. Floyd was, uh, was really the, uh, the pillar um, for the whole thing. I mean, he came and, uh, and, and he knew everybody. Um, and he knew where there were players, and he knew uh, the players um, that that might be good fits for for the team. So uh, he was able to to get the guys that that got together that that won the Allen Cup, and then uh, they were able to uh, to parlay that into the uh, the World Championship. I followed them like you couldn't. We were so proud. I think a lot of people don't realize how proud we were of the Belleville McFarlands back then. They were. You know, there was the, to win the Allen Cup and go over there and win the goal. It was unbelievable, and uh, it's too bad that people don't remember that. I, uh, people my age remember because they were great hockey players out there. They'd be all be making about $10 million a year right about now. Yeah, it's the stuff of uh, folklore. It's the stuff of legend. Living up in Belleville under what Floyd had basically accomplished as a hockey player was something that was we didn't really take notice at the beginning more we appreciated it as we grew up and we when we ventured off into our uh, uh, different field you know I could only imagine you know but you'd go to the Belleville uh, Memorial Arena and they'd be you know the place would be packed you know 2200 people watching uh, 
some pretty good hockey players. In, the, in that league and the, and the senior league, there was guys playing there would be stars in the National Hockey League now. I was there for both the parades, and, uh, and it, was, it was like, you know, it was like a kid in Santa Claus parade, another parade, wow, this is great, you know, and there's all these uh, convertibles and uh, their names are written on them. But we knew who everybody was. You know, we didn't need any names uh, on the cars for the parades. And I remember that they had, um, you know, sort of convertible cars, for one for each family. And uh, my mother and my father were in the car with myself and my brother Peter, who by that time was about two years old, I suppose. And I was petrified, you know, <laughs> all of these, you know. A, I'd never been in a convertible. I'd certainly never been, you know, I was just... I was about four, I guess, four, going like this, peeping over the top and just kind of waving once in a while, and then you know back to my <laughs> um, uh, back to my seat. I, I, I yes, I remember that, and my mother trying to encourage me to wave more, because the people in the car in front of us, the Smirk family, their girls were standing on the seats, you know, <laughs> hi everybody. Um, but I was a bit shy, so. Kids uh, along the street had these little hats that were made that said uh, more Max More, I think, on these little round hats that they wore, and uh, um, it, there were a lot of people. I was aware that it was a very happy time, a very joyous time in their lives. There was a lot of, uh, you know, people coming in and out of the house, uh, you know, uh, get-togethers, parties, uh, you know, they, they were very close, the, the team. The, they, they were all best friends, the guys on the team, and so we were always visiting each other and uh, doing things together. As time goes on, you start to realize how, how important that team was, and, and then you find out that your father played for Canada, and you're like, wow, he played for Canada? That's, that's amazing. So then you start to hear everything, and then these guys continually coming over. We grew and understood what Floyd was all about and what they had accomplished with the Belden McFarlands. He wasn't a glory days type of guy that would sit back and talk about, um, you know, how great it was. But, uh, you know, he he was certainly proud of that, very proud of uh, those group of men. And, um, you know, having grown up here and, and having, you know, by been coached by some of them and, and you know, having lots of interaction with them over the years, the guys that uh, that that stayed here, um, they had a tremendous uh, impact on this community. I knew that there was something special about what he did from a very young age, and of course, as I got older and started to understand uh, more than I, I really did, uh, recognize the accomplishments, especially of that McFarland team, which were, were truly uh, remarkable. Well, my father was always very uh, 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 determined and ambitious. I remember him telling me when he was a young child, he deciding that, you know, he wanted to be a hockey player. He, he's from Toronto. And he would go down to Christie Pitts, where they have the big outdoor rinks, or at least they had at the time, and watch, when he was just little, watch the hockey players playing out, so outdoors there. And he, he was so fascinated by it. He said, I want to do that. He tried out for a team in Toronto. When he got there, there was over 150 kids that were there to play for a junior B team. And he said that uh, there's no way he was gonna get cut from this team. And how they did their, their, their tryouts were, they would line up three guys at once, go to a rush and shoot the puck at the goalie. And if he pointed to you, you went back in the line. And if he didn't point to you, you got off the ice. And my father said he never, got, he, he never got pointed to until about the fourth rush. He just kept coming back in. He got cut three times, just kept coming back in. And finally, I said, you, over there, finally. So, and then because of that, he, uh, he ended up making that team. So it's amazing uh, how he just wouldn't take no for an answer. Floyd was a rock. Um, he, he, uh, he didn't take any prisoners. Um, he, he was uh, a, an extremely steady defenseman. Had the NHL have been... 20 teams when my father was playing, you know, people would have talked to him along the lines that they talk about a Brian Sutter. Just the ultimate team player, whatever it took to win, whatever it took to compete, it was going to happen. I didn't work in the mines, but I think it was just the same thing. And uh, no, you appreciated it. Eh? And, and you had that give you character. I mean, think about working in the mines and, and you got a break playing hockey. I mean, you'd play your heart out to play. Floyd was a uh, uh, you know what I like to say, a ferocious competitor. Um, 
he loved to compete, uh, loved to win, uh, and he understood the work that it took, and, and he understood what it did for a person as a human being outside of the rink or off the playing field, too. That's why the Crawford family was like that. I knew my dad was uh, uh, pretty special in hockey circles from a very young age. You know, he was coaching uh, senior hockey. Those are my earliest recollections. Uh, he was coaching the old Mohawks, and uh, we used to get to go on a, on a road trip every now and then. He had that level of competitiveness that no matter what, the game was never over. And even within that game, you were, he was thinking about the next time we play this team, we're going to take the lessons that we learned in this game. So, and that stuck with me. There, there was no compromising with Floyd. He, that's the way it was. And uh, I'm, I'm eternally thankful for it because uh, there were valuable lessons. And he, he, he was a very demanding coach, uh, but he, he wouldn't, we always thought it was about the score with Floyd. and. And it wasn't until years later you realized that the score had nothing to do with it. He definitely had a had a passion, and he he when you love something, you want to talk about it all the time, right? Because if you want uh, to, to, I said that to share to share that that knowledge. So and that was a constant. It was a constant. There was always something brewing in in his head. He used to. Uh use his psychology on me and uh, say, hey, you really look good out there today, Peter. Your team only got beat by 14 goals, but my God, you look good. You were only responsible for seven of those goals. And that's the kind of psychology he'd use. And, you know, even though I would kind of shrug it off and uh, say to myself, yeah, you're not going to get to me, it got to me because when he left the room, I was like, oh, I'll show him, you know. My dad used to have little tricks he would play on you to try to get you motivated. And it would work until you figured it out. There was always lessons, but it was always sports and, well, life too, but through sport you learn a lot about life, you know, teamwork and defeat and, you know, camaraderie, all kinds of things like that. But sitting at the kitchen table every night for dinner and the salt, the pepper, the ketchup, they were all, this is your defenseman, this is the centerman, this is, and he was going through plays with the, with the guys. He instilled in all of us uh, a really good level of competitiveness. Um, he instilled in us accountability and uh, you know, I think uh, some of the earliest memories that I have of the accountability part of it would be my dad would never get uh, angry with us if you uh, if you missed a net or you didn't score a goal or, or something like that. But when you didn't compete, boy, he he didn't like that. He was a big believer in uh, you're as good as your last practice or your last game, and that's the motivation to uh, keep coming back and 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 try and better yourself. My father wasn't the kind of person that talked about himself, right? There were no trophies, you know. The gold medal was, and probably still is in a, in a drawer somewhere. You know, it wasn't, he wanted, you know, to be accepted for what he was doing right then and for us to, you know, looking back, to carve our own path, not to, not to live through him. You know, he started to see that we'd get some recognition in maybe the intelligencer or on local radio or stuff, stuff like that. And like any kid, you know, you'd feel good about yourself. And my dad would always say, you can't eat those newspaper clippings. You got to have cornflakes on the table. So, you know, I didn't understand it at the time, but I, I understand what he meant now. You know, you can't rest on your laurels. You always have to continue to keep working. You always have to answer the next challenge. Floyd kind of sat back and watched everything develop. And he'd prod, you know, and poke every once in a while to say, hey, stand up for yourself, kid. Your brother's over there making a fool of you. You know, he wouldn't say it directly, but he'd, he'd make you think. The Volkswagen van, this is again Floyd playing tricks on us. But we were all like, Peter was 17 or 16 or 15. And we're like, you know, we're all in our teenage years. And he was trying to, get us in shape, motivated, right? So I don't know if, because mys mysteriously, the starter went on it. 
So we used to jump start it by pushing the Volkswagen van down the street. Dad's going out. We need to we need to we need you to push the, the van. So we'd all get up and do whatever and so there'd be four or five of us. And then we we uh, got so good at it that he said, I bet you you can't get it started going up the hill. So that would just make us more determined. So we could actually get it started going up the Yeah. But I can never figure out how come the van always ended up back home if we have to push it to get it started? Would you just leave it running the whole time or whatever? Oh, wait, park it on the hill. <laughs> and I say this with the utmost respect. I spent, uh, I can honestly say, I spent a year of my life hating the man's guts and the rest of, the, rest of my life loving him like a father. Uh, you know, Floyd was a little bit ahead of us um, and we didn't always get the message and uh, that didn't stop from delivering it and he delivered it in spades and uh, eventually you start to get it. I think Floyd's favorite line with me is, oh, so you think you can, eh? Huh, okay, sure you can, you know? And, and that, that, that's the way he found, just like a good coach, you gotta find what makes a person tick, what makes an athlete wanna perform to the best of their ability. My father was basically gonna uh, realize his dream of going to the National Hockey League back in the six-team league. Uh, he was part of the Montreal Canadiens organization. He was playing in Chicoutimi for the, the Chicoutimi Saguenines of the Quebec Senior uh, League, and uh, my father had uh, been told he was going to play for three games, and uh, my understanding was he was at practice that day, and he was quite, quite, quite excited about his, his, his boyhood dream coming to fruition, or almost there. He was just going at it a little bit too hard and uh, hit a goal post, and his shoulder uh, had to be operated on, and uh, crushed his, basically his dream of playing in the NHL. And so he was sent to hospital, and um, uh, my, you know, my mother was, I believe, the only bilingual nurse on staff. So she was uh, more or less assigned to, you know, his case, and that's how they met, and things evolved from there. He said he never got his uh, NHL contract, but he got his uh, million-dollar contract when he married my mother. My mother's very strong-willed. My father's very strong-willed, and uh, yeah, so you, you got to hear some interesting conversations. There's lots of love there, obviously, but they, they, uh, they, <laughs> you know, couldn't think of two fire, more fiery backgrounds, you know, like a, an Irishman and a, you know, a, a hot-blooded French Canadian. Sometimes, you know, he he got knocked down and and uh, got traded to a different team and whatnot, but he always had his mother or my mother beside him, uh, encouraging him and making sure that uh, there was food on the table and. Always there was. It all started with Floyd coming to town and saying, hey, I like this town, and let's win. And they put together a winner. I think it all starts there. So I think they really, the family, starting with Floyd and Pauline, really created Belleville uh, as, a, as a viable hockey town in the future. My parents were fantastic uh, ambassadors in the city, and uh, my mother especially was uh, always telling us and making sure that we were towing the line and going to school. and. And, and going to church so often, you know, and, uh, you know, sometimes we didn't go to church. We'd have a little fun with that, but we always uh, managed to uh, not embarrass my mother too much. My dad and mom have always said Belleville's a great place to, uh, to, to, to raise kids, and it really is. They take great pride in their children. They've been always very, um, very fair, uh, tried to be very fair about not being, you know, about favoritism, you know if someone was, was more successful than another, you know, they still, you know, would, 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 would talk just as much about the ones who were, say, less successful or less visible than the ones who were. Yeah, they were always very insistent on that. Yes, I'm, you know, giving everyone their due. I think that there was a sense of, you know, real strong sense of community. I know that they both mentioned that, that they, there'd been a lot of places, hockey had taken them a lot of places, but they felt home that when they were here was noisy, <laughs> very noisy, obviously, because I was the eldest girl, I was a girl, and then after that there were six boys in a row, then my sister was born, and then another brother 
a few years later. Peter, so Michael, cool. Bobby, Mark, Lewis, Todd, Danielle, and then Eric. Oh, and, and myself. It was hectic. It was uh, always something happening. Structured chaos, basically. It, uh, it was a, uh, it's a big family, obviously. Okay, we were always involved in very sporting activities. You know, my brothers obviously played hockey, but, um, uh, you know, we would just uh, be busy, very busy, very, very chaotic, uh, you know, in and out, in and out, in and out. <laughs> Can you imagine what dinner was like around their house? It was always entertaining around the, uh, the kitchen table. We had our rules, our hidden rules. We had rules for whose seat was, you know, uh, nobody could sit in the seat in the front room to watch the, you know, 12 by 12 black and white TV. You know, there was four of us in a bedroom, I mean, bunk beds. It was uh, just chaos, basically, from the time you woke up to the time you went to bed. If you had to uh, leave the room for whatever reason, whether it was to answer the phone or get in trouble by your father, uh, you had to say something specific. Don't take my chair. And then you had to get someone to second it. And if you could verify it when you came back, you only had a certain amount of time to get back, then things would happen. Like there was some pretty good scraps over, over chairs and positions by the, t by the TV. If you had to do those dishes after supper, it was, you'd hear uh, upstairs just a ton of noise. And it's like a stickball game going on in the bedroom that was the biggest and it was above above the kitchen so you wanted to get upstairs and the lights were shaking and all, all kinds of stuff. Athletics was a big part because my dad was really into athletics when he when he was growing up. Um, you know he was a he was a champion runner track and field and football player. He played all, all the sports that were available in Toronto. In the spring and summer you know, it went from a hockey rink to baseball or soccer or, you know, lacrosse, whatever the discipline was that particular part of the season or that year. You know, our backyard was small, but there was no grass on it because we were always playing. I remember in the backyard on Victoria Avenue, my dad built the first rinks for us, and we had a tree right in the middle of the, in the backyard. And so it was a and that he would always make us do our, you know, figure eights around the tree, right? You learn not to hit the tree. <laughs> there was lots of road hockey. There was hide and seek. And like, I mean, when we played hide and seek, <laughs> you used the whole block. And we weren't, like, I look at the way some people uh, uh, are very protective of their kids and whatnot. I remember hiding, like, on garage rooftops and... You know, uh, yeah, kids were uh, no fear. We had no fear, right? I mean, it was just crazy. We just, uh, everybody was hockey crazy. We lived next door to an apartment building, and they had a rink in the back, and it was, to us, it was huge. It was like, it was like the memorial. It was this huge rink. When we grew up, he used to rave about his kids playing out front of the house, and, and you know, would argue with the neighbors who said, you know, can't let your kids play on the street, or... You know, look at your front lawn, you know, Floyd, you're a disgrace to the neighborhood. And Floyd would go, you know what, I'll raise the kids, you grow your grass. I remember as the Charles Street Cougars, we would have some uh, heated uh, exchanges with some of the neighboring street uh, hockey teams and uh, a fight or two broke out along the way and, you know, so you, you absolutely did look out for your teammates and for your brothers and sisters. and. Uh, it was a lot of fun though, a lot of fun. I think to this day we will all tell you we were undefeated. We were awesome. Uh, we, would, uh, we would take on all comers and uh, it was basically uh, the Barrett's next door, the Crawfords, uh, a few other kids from around the neighborhood that we made honorary cougars and uh, you know we would uh, make, we used to make our own nets out of wood. <laughs> and we'd lug these damn things across town. It didn't matter what it was, there was always something going on. We, whether we were playing uh, little mini stick hockey upstairs on our knees uh, with a rolled up sock and shooting it into the net and fighting over whether it went in or not. You know, you had a lot of sibling rivalry uh, and uh, as I look back on it, it's probably one of the reasons why, you know, I developed the way I did because I had older brothers who I wanted to play with and wanted to 
hang out with and I had younger brothers who wanted to hang out with me so you got the best of both worlds you got the the push to be good uh, to play with the older guys and you got the ability to just beat the crap out of the younger ones everybody wanted to be better at everything than what your other brother or sister was and uh, you know it was uh, it wasn't really vied upon but everybody knew deep down that you wanted to be better than your brother uh, you wanted to get uh, a better ac accolade, uh, and so you would just go out and do the things you needed to do to become better. I think they all drove each other. I think that's part of it. I think there's a, there's always going to be a, a bit of a, a sibling rivalry, but also a sibling encouragement. And so, uh, you know, uh, hey, if he can do it, I can do it. She can do it, I can do it. So there, there, there was that aspect to it, too. Just everything. It could have been, you know, who's getting what seat at the table. You know, there was always something competition-based in our house. I certainly had to break up a few fights, uh, you know. <laughs> Just, you know, scraps. We're all kind of outgoing, and I think you need to be outgoing in a big family just so that you get hurt. The home competition itself uh, absolutely prepared us for whatever we were going to uh, face in life, whether it was in, in sports or the business world. And, uh, uh, we knew that, you know, you don't get good at something uh, unless you practice. And, uh, and, and more importantly, you don't get good at something unless you have a passion for it. I think everyone in our family, you know, has that personality type where we wanted to be successful on our own. You know, not just we weren't going to ride on, you know, Floyd or Pauline's coattails. We were going to, you know, carve our own path. We all quietly uh, admired what each of us had in our qualities and there was the compete level. There was a constant compete and as I said around the dinner table there was a compete for that last piece of bread you know and whether you used your mind to get it or whether you used your brawn to get it there was the compete. There was motivation around the corner in that house probably all day long. <laughs> they push you right they're bigger they're stronger they're faster a little more developed, you know, in their ability to, to play sport and, and to be successful at, at, a, at a discipline. So, you know, you would learn just by osmosis. I do remember my brother Bobby being especially obsessed with uh, improving his shot. In fact, he destroyed the doors of our garage <laughs> uh, practicing his shot. Much like kids will shoot basketballs all day, you know, I found incredible joy in shooting pucks against this garage door <laughs> and, you know, it's, it is what it is. I just love doing it and I love looking at different parts of the, of the garage and, and, you know, being able to hit them, you know, with my shot, you know, close, far, uh, you know, at will. And who knows how many shots I took, but it was just my thing that some kids like to ride a bike, some kids like to you know, draw. I love shooting the puck against the garage and my hands are still sore now because of it. It was a beautiful garage uh, when we moved in in 1967, uh, but by about 1974-73 uh, it had seen its better days. Uh, I, we used to have a, the homemade wooden net and we'd uh, shoot pucks off of a plastic uh, uh, sheet that my father uh, got. The guy that I would say actually put the death knell into the garage was my brother Bob because he would be out there constantly just slapping pucks and you know Bob wasn't very accurate uh, and he'd hit the garage a lot and it I believe one day just <clears throat> fell. Didn't matter to them that you know we had a nice garage door or we had a nice front or back lawn. It, it had it mattered to them that their kids had the opportunity to grow up um, doing what they loved and, and be able to be kids. Well, you'd be up in a hallway that was maybe three foot by three foot and you got six young, ambitious, competitive guys all trying to bat a wad of paper into a makeshift goal. And, uh, oh, there were some hellacious body checks uh, tossed out. I'm surprised that house is still standing. They were always playing hockey out on the road, uh, out on some rink somewhere, in the living room, in, you know, where, <laughs> wherever there was, you know, a, a wide open space. Uh, they were always playing hockey. 
always practicing. Tell people the toughest games we've ever played were in our backyard. So <laughs> we always had um, interest in hockey right from day one. You know, I think it's safe to say they were, they were all completely dedicated to hockey. It was their first love. And let me tell you, if they weren't on your team, it wasn't much fun when they showed up because you were going to take a stick across the shins if you thought you were taking the, something from them. The way they were raised, uh, you know, in a big house on Charles Street and, uh, you know, you, you made your own fun and, I mean, hockey it was automatic that they were going to play hockey. The battles for the equipment on Saturday morning were fierce, right, like because you didn't want to be the one with the wet gear. And, you know, you wanted the good pair of gloves, not the ones with the holes in them. And I had hand-me-down skates. The first pair I had were from my sister, Susan. Okay, so we didn't care about um, what we looked like or anything like that. We always wanted to chase the bigger kids in the neighborhood. Uh, I think there was a family that didn't have a large income and uh, sports was the you know, the outlet, and it was the way to go. We didn't have much, but anybody was welcome in our house. And, uh, you know, growing up like that and looking for the best in people was something that, you know, was just, just the way it was. I just think that they were brought up that way. And I, if you ever talk to them, they have great manners. And they're, they're good Canadian guys. They, 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 they never, never impressed with themselves. They were ordinary guys. I think as uh, children, you are always seeking uh, your parents' approval for something. And uh, my mother and father were, you know, too busy uh, a lot of times. I mean, they'd notice, okay, and they'd say, hey, you know, way to go. Uh, but they wouldn't go overboard. I think from top to bottom in terms of uh, just what they've done for the city and, and, and as, as, as they've become part of the city from the moment Floyd arrived, in the 50s, uh, I, I sometimes refer to them as the first family of, of hockey in Belleville. You know, I used to get very upset when people used to call me a Crawford, you know, because I was Bob Crawford or Bobby Crawford back then. You know, I wanted to become an individual. And I think all of us wanted that. I, I think of Belleville when I think of the Crawfords. I think the two are, are, uh, are as one, so to speak. Everything in the wintertime was geared towards downtown. And the Memorial Arena was more about, it was like an old friend, you know? It was like seeing an old friend. It was the only rink in town at that time. And uh, they would, uh, they'd be down there in various ways. Well, their whole family was there from dawn till dusk, <laughs> playing at various levels and probably playing at two or three levels. You know, it's, it's more than an arena to me. It just, it's, uh... It's, it, feel, it certainly feels like a second home. I mean, I remember the memorial before it had seats. Uh, you know, it was just benches all around. But then they put the seats in uh, around when I was probably, you know, eight or nine or 10 or something like that. And my mom sat in a single seat by the visitor's bench. And I, I, I never asked her why she sat there, but I think, you know, she just liked the solitude of watching. And, and even at that day, I don't think she, she was someone that wanted to ever get involved in maybe minor hockey politics. She just was there, see her boys, and she liked the solitude of sitting in that single seat and uh, watching the game. So you could always look uh, over and and, uh, and have the comfort of seeing my mom there. She never ever, she wasn't a, a yeller or a screamer or anything like that, but she watched pretty intently. And I think her demeanor probably has a lot to do with uh, their success because, uh, you know, Pauline is very calm and cool and, uh, you know, you, you'd be down at that rink on uh, rep Sundays and uh, <laughs> most Crawford boys could act up with the best of them out on the ice and uh, it never fazed her a bit. She was the one that was the general, the operations person, made sure the bills got paid, made sure that there was, you know, the things that, that most of most people did, you know, to make sure our household ran well, but she upped it about 10 levels because she was dealing with an incredible number of kids in an incredible com uh, competitive environment. She was like a, uh, a drill sergeant, really. She uh, extremely well organized, uh, 
how that woman managed that household. Uh, if they gave uh, awards, she'd have the gold medal. She set all the rules. Floyd enforced the rules, <laughs> but she set the rules. Well, Dad was away a lot, and so she basically uh, it was down to her to make sure you know we uh, you know did our homework and you know kept up with our schoolwork. With uh, eleven mouths to feed, uh, the paycheck had to be spent uh, judiciously because you know you had to go to the. Uh, local lob laws or whatever it was and you know so you bought some day old bread okay you know but you saved 10 cents a loaf uh, you bought uh, the powdered milk and made powdered milk instead of having dairy bottled milk just stuff like that so it just the uh, the sheer economic uh, uh, budgetary mastery that she had uh, was just marvelous seven boys trying to maneuver them she did it with her mind you know and, and she uh she knew it was right and she knew the right way of doing things and through trial and error, you know, you educate yourself and you learn how to live your life. She would give us these boundaries, but we were allowed to stray from them up to a certain point. And then if we'd strayed too far, then the wrath of Floyd would come in. But she, you know, she, she, would, she wouldn't always rely on him. To do that, she was pretty good at at uh, laying down the law too. She made sure my father was knew where he was going, when he was going, and why he was going. They were a great team. She's as close to a saint as I've ever met. Her kids were everything to her, um, to to uh, to a point that you know, like she quite often did nothing for herself. You know, she's very selfless in that regard. She. Uh, you know, like whatever it was, like raising nine kids and and uh, and at times, you know, having to raise my father as well, you know, as an eternal teenager chasing hockey, um, you know, like she she was the uh, grounded, spiritual, and uh, she was yeah, she was just a fantastic lady. Because that summer I worked at the tennis court, that would have been maybe 1975, and uh, Mrs. Crawford would come in the morning and play tennis really early in the morning. I remember she, her and her partner would be about the first people there when I unlocked the gate at like 7 in the morning. It was probably the only hour she could spare in the whole day for herself. And uh, her and her partner, I, I can't remember who her partner was, they, they wore the whole tennis whites, and uh, Mrs. Crawford was, was darn good, very good. I remember one lady at the tennis club, the Queen of Tennis Club, saying, is that your mother? She's a great tennis player. My gosh, she's just kicking everybody's butt. And uh, she never, you know, she was always happy to be there. She always had a smile on her face. She was very sportsmanlike. Um, I wish I had a little bit more of her sportsmanlike uh, attributes. Uh, I'm sure that we could all use it. She was very competitive um, uh, as well. And she was also a very good diver and she loved skiing and skating, you know. So, you know, we get the sports abilities from both sides. My mother was a great, um, athlete. I think she was probably a better athlete than Floyd. We all knew about Floyd and, and you know his ferocious uh, desire to compete and win and, and you know we always just assumed the boys got it all from Floyd but uh, uh, he doesn't call her his million dollar wife for nothing. You know, my father would you know work two to three jobs while you know trying to you know maintain his his love of coaching and uh, she made that possible for him. My brothers Mark and Louis, I think, were the only two brothers ever to play against each other in a Memorial Cup final. That's pretty unusual because back then Cornwall drafted their players from Ontario, but they played in the Quebec League. Well, it happened um, the one year, and Cornwall won that year. The next year, um, the, uh, the, the Rangers won, so they each got, they each got their Memorial Cup. The Royals uh, ended up meeting Kitchener in the final, and uh, Floyd Crawford, the father, was asked who he was cheering for, and he said, Cornwall all the way. Louis gets another shot next year, and guess what? Kitchener wins the Memorial Cup with Louis next year. <laughs> when we did get the Memorial Cup, I know it was an emotional time for uh, my parents, and. Uh, uh, Mark, he was on a straight bean line for the cup, and uh, unfortunately I had to sit on the bench and watch. I think I got about five shifts that game, and uh, it was a pleasure to watch. And w w They were a dominant team, and 
And uh, Floyd and Pauline were the first out, you know, to congratulate me because of, uh, you know, what had taken place and then congratulated Mark. And again, no favors, no favoritisms, just they, it's kind of tough to, to deal with uh, both sides of the coin. After the Royals won the Memorial Cup in Regina, that was a huge upset beating the Peterborough Peets and uh, winning it in overtime. And the team bus was outside after and, and Floyd comes out <laughs> and he's just ecstatic. And Floyd says, I'm so happy, I might have another kid. <laughs> My sister Susie was always, you know, we always looked at her as the, the brilliant one, incredibly smart, incredibly talented. Um, you know, unfortunately for her, there weren't a lot of opportunities for girls in sports back then. I think if she had the opportunity, she would have been very similar to my sister Danielle. But women's sports just weren't at that point yet. She was always a very adventurous soul. She went off to university. Uh, and then from there, she bounced around uh, Ottawa and Quebec and then had a penchant for uh, traveling across to uh, Europe. And uh, that's, you know, where she lives now is in uh, Rome. And uh, my sister Susie's a really, really neat person. Uh, my brother Peter, who's two years younger than I am, and he lives in uh, Delaware now. Uh, he's a commodities broker, and he has been doing that for years and years. He went to states on a on a scholarship, a hockey scholarship, and ended up playing pro in the um, international league. And you know, through that, he he became a commodities broker, and and he's still there. I really enjoyed the the game of hockey, and uh, you know, I was okay at it. I mean, I was never uh, I was very good at all aspects of the game. I wasn't great at any of them. Peter wasn't a very fast skater. You know, he was a very good skater, but he didn't have world class speed. But he was in, a, you know, had world had a world class head and world class hands. And you know, when you're on a small rink in the backyard and you're playing against that, you know, you learn a lot. I mean, Michael to this day is probably one of the best, you know, unheralded high school athletes ever in Belleville. Everything he did, he was great at. I always enjoyed myself when I played, and people say, "Why don't you try a little harder?" You know. I'll try when I want to. <laughs> he was the smoothest skater. I mean, he was effortless. I used to sit there and marvel at how easy he could make skating look. I wasn't really in, uh, as intense as some of the others, but I could turn it on when I wanted to. Michael was just good at everything. You know, he was a, a, a really fast, strong, smart player. To have those two guys to try to catch because as brothers, you don't want to take a backseat to anybody. So that was a huge advantage for me. Robert, who did very well in hockey, he was a very talented player and played in the NHL um, for uh, the Hartford Whalers. Uh, then he was traded to New the New York Rangers and he finished his career in Washington. He lives in Connecticut. Uh, and he runs um, a, you know, a large sort of sporting business with hockey rinks and hockey team. Bobby is a great skater. He's probably the best skater of the bunch and fast. And, but you didn't watch him and go, oh my God, he's good. He gets called up to Junior B and we're thinking, oh, now he's going to get it. Now he's going to play with men. And uh, he's the best player on the ice. We went to a tournament in a little town called St. Isidore up Eastern Ontario way. And uh, we were short a couple of players that week and the flu was going around. So Bobby played for us. And uh, I remember uh, he was our best player. <laughs> and he was a year younger. And I remember there was a guy named Mike Willman and myself. on. We were kind of the utility players. And I remember him and I looking at him and so we go, thank God Bobby's a year younger than us or we'd be out of a job. Well, he, stayed, he went and salt, played in Salt Lake the whole year in the minors. And the next year, uh, he was determined that he was going to make that team and uh, he picked up a newspaper and he said uh, it was this year's hopefuls and he fully expected to see his name and he didn't see his name so that he he told me that he had to you know uh, rethink the way he shot uh, just think out of the box and he recreated himself. He worked even harder and and he managed to have, you know, many successful years in in pro sports. You know, that's where your competitive drive comes in and, and looking back, I think one of the things that really helped me was the fact that 
I grew up in an environment that was incredibly competitive. So I didn't, you know, get overwhelmed by it. A lot of very talented players get overwhelmed in that kind of environment because everybody's good. I mean, you tore down the garage with the shots and he was known for his shot. He scored a lot of goals in the NHL. I always remember my first game in Hartford. And I told people I should have retired after that game. It, was, uh, it says everything about my relationship with Hartford and the community is we were playing Boston and at the start of the game, obviously the game was sold out. Probably 70% of the people were cheering for Boston at the start of the game. And we fell behind and, you know, one thing, you know, the game progressed. Um, we were losing, I think it was three to two. I scored to make it three, three. And then I scored again to win the game, to make it four, three. And seeing that crowd change from 70, you know, 30% Hartford fans, 70, you know, to 70% Hartford fans, people being excited, uh, you know, to be associated with a winning team that could beat the Boston Bruins, you know. Yeah, I look back and, you know, out of everything that I've done in hockey, playing in Hartford was the most rewarding thing that I had from a professional standpoint. Mark was more intense, a tougher hockey player than Bobby. Bobby was a right winger, had all kinds of skills. Uh, Mark was a, more like his father. Mark was a tremendous player. He was a, a Brian Sutter type individual. You know, wasn't incredibly fast. You know, wasn't incredibly, you know, the most talented guy on the ice, but he was the strongest willed, a lot like Floyd. It would do whatever it took to win would figure a way to win. Mark, uh, when he hit you, you knew it. You know, he was such a, uh, a fierce competitor and uh, not a dirty hockey player. But his hits were all clean, he was, you know, but uh, like so many other Crawfords, he wanted to win. And he was a left winger, I was a right winger. First time I'd ever played against him. And uh, I remember back checking with him, you know, on him and thinking because I was at that point I was one of the better players in the league you know that year I had 50 some goals and saying ah maybe I'll let him go and give him a chance to go score a goal and the puck went my way and for a split second I thought do I let him go and let him go in and score of course I didn't I tripped him <laughs> <laughs> and the thing I remember about Mark was he always asked really good questions he was very inquisitive and very curious Mark was is the ultimate optimist. That's why he's been a successful coach. You know, he's gets up every day. Doesn't matter what comes his way. He's just gonna get. He's gonna plug through it and find a way to be successful. He's got tremendous confidence in himself and his abilities. But he was one of those guys you couldn't help but like. You know, even if the team was doing badly, he didn't get bad press. And he was very open and upfront with you. Uh, you know, that, that was Crawford way. But Mark was more of a student of uh, the game than I think uh, any of us were. Um, where when we were sitting around on a kitchen table and my father would have the salt and the pepper shakers and the bottle of vinegar and a bottle of ketchup and they'd, they'd put uh, situational chalkboard uh, type uh, strategies out there. And, uh, Mark was always very good and he, you know, we're, some of us would leave the table and say, okay, that was pretty interesting. Mark would sit there and talk to my father and say, well, what if, uh, blah, blah, blah. And uh, he, he would delve into a, another uh, tangent of uh, what was being diagrammed on the kitchen table. And uh, I think, uh, you know, the fact that he's quite analytical uh, with his uh, coaching philosophies, um, you know, puts him up in the elite level. I mean, he's really, really sharp. We have a lot in common. I, I'll start right off that uh, Mark was coach of the year in the American Hockey League, so was I. And Mark was uh, coach of the year in the National Hockey League, so was I. So we have a lot in common. They were a team of underachievers when they were in Quebec, when they came to Colorado and uh, with Mark's guidance and coaching and the fact that mm, a guy by the name of Patrick Waugh was his goaltender. Um, you know, that was uh, something. Big time proud. I mean, you talked about the Crawford name on trophies. I mean, it's on the Stanley Cup. I mean, the holy grail of what we are all about, you know, hockey. It really didn't hit home until later when he when he brought the, the trophy home. And, and uh, you know, you see the sort of life that, it, the, that the trophy takes on. I thought it was 
totally fitting for how we grew up on Charles Street in Belleville uh, was he brought the cup home in the house and then he said, just hang on, I'm walking across the street. And he walked over to uh, Mr. and Mrs. Lloyd, who are both passed on now, and knocked on the door and uh, with the trophy in his hand. And she was just in awe. And they sat there and said, conversed about this is why we were playing out in front you know, breaking windows and running into cars and all the rest of those good things. Uh, that's what, what it's all about. This is the Stanley Cup. My mom had this table and she put it out in the front step and it was like eight o'clock in the morning on a Sunday morning. And it was actually before eight, I remember this. It was before eight o'clock. And there we were, my mom and I, and maybe uh, a couple of my nieces and nephews uh, were around my kids who were really young at the time. Um, and there was the Stanley Cup and the covering that they have uh, over the table. And there was some traffic going up and down Charles Street. So people, you'd see the people driving up, hey, that's the Stanley Cup. <laughs> I can remember uh, the guy across the street, uh, Mike, the prison guard. Uh, Mike came over in his bathrobe. So it was a while, like people were coming out in their bathrobes to see the cup. Uh, people were coming from uh, all the different uh, families uh, uh, on our street to come over and see it and it really was a special uh, moment. I mean that was it, it's the you know the old cliche you know you play for the Stanley Cup when you're playing road hockey and and we did a lot uh, play road hockey on Charles Street in Belleville and um, to have it there and to be able to share it uh, first of all, with people that you grew up with was, was really, really special. And it was a great memory. I, 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 I think the thing that sticks out for me the most was just the excitement in my mother. Uh, she didn't get excited very often. So that was really nice. I tip my hat to my brother, Mark. He did a wonderful job because he remembered um, all of his uh, coaches uh, growing up in Belleville. Um, the neighbors, uh, the Charles Street Cougars. Uh, he had them all over to our little party. It, it was quite special. I'm telling you what, what a wonderful, magic day. Louis was fearless, fearless. Um, and, um, you know, anything that uh, he wanted to try, he tried it. And, uh, you know, some were good experiences, some were not but Louis was uh, full of energy. Louis is, um, uh, was known in the OHL when he played as a fighter, and that's kind of how I think of how he's kind of gone through life. Louis, when he was younger, told me that, you know, he went out to play ball hockey and one of the neighborhood kids punched him in the nose and he came in the house and was kind of sniffling a little bit. He was quite young, maybe five or six, and Floyd helped clean him up and turned him around and said, well, your turn. <laughs> And uh, Louis got the message. Uh, you know, you, you, you give no quarter and you ask uh, for none. And, and I'm sure all those guys learned that along the way. Uh, Louis, who was five years to the day, we were both born on the, the same day in November the 5th. And uh, one day we were out in the front yard and somebody had given us some boxing gloves or something. So I was 19 years old and he was 14 years old, and he came out with the boxing gloves and says, here, and he threw them at me. He says, put them on, let's go. Let's, let's go. And I get lost. Uh, no, I, I'll hurt you or something. You know, I'm 19, I'm five years older than you. And uh, yeah, so my dad was there, and he said, put them on, let's see how he does. So I did, and I found out, because he caught me with a hook and just about knocked me out. And he was just a skinny little kid. And then I kind of lost my temper, right? And then he ran into the backyard. <laughs> he was trying to always catch up to Mark or Bobby or, uh, you know, help Todd out or Michael, myself, my sisters. Um, and, uh, you know, he just tried very, very hard. And, uh, you know, through sheer willpower uh, is how I would describe Lou. He was had always gone to try out, try out for a rep team in Belleville and never made it, never made it. Floyd told me this story and never made the team and he'd say, I want to go try out again and Floyd would go, all right, let's go, you know. 
set you up for whatever, but let's go. And uh, they're at the Dick Ellis, and Floyd's watching through the window by the dressing rooms, and, uh, and he's, he's getting a little agitated because the kids are all out on the ice, and he doesn't, he's like, okay, where's Louie? Where's Louie? And then all of a sudden, this guy comes skating by the glass and goes, taps the glass. It's Louie, and Floyd's like, oh my God, he got really good. He's amazing. How my career didn't really take off until around Bantam. And uh, what it was, was Mark had just got drafted to the uh, Cornwall Royals, and at Christmas time, he came back with a brand new pair of skates, and he gave them to Floyd, because he wanted Floyd to have a brand new pair of these new Lang skates. Floyd said, what? Yeah, okay, thanks, Mark. And Mark left, went back to Cornwall, and he, he put them, and he said, here, try these out, Louie. And because I was a terrible skater, awful, awful. I was skating on my ankles, and that's where I started to develop a little bit of a reputation of a good skater, and that's where I think I, I uh, was able to excel a little bit in, uh, in, in uh, performing my duties, which were to work hard, play tough, and uh, create uh, havoc on the ice. If there's ever a story about a person who has tenacity and who has patience, it's Louis. Never drafted, you know, always the first one that, you know, people would look past when it came to being, you know, a, a player that was considered for the NHL. But again, the ultimate team player was incredibly tough. I mean, Louis was 180 pounds soaking wet. And, you know, he was an enforcer taking on guys 240 pounds and, and uh, being pretty successful. <laughs> but the single thing that runs right through the whole family, you're right, is that, is that determination uh, to do well and succeed. And, and Louie was a great example of uh, you know, a little bit of talent and a lot of sandpaper. <laughs> there weren't too many guys that, uh, that you know, you know, wouldn't do or go through a wall to succeed like Louie. Back when he was playing for the Rochester Americans, would have been in the uh, early 80s, I guess, and Mark was playing Fredericton. And off came the gloves when uh, they were playing against each other. And in his interview after the game, Louis said, well, I've got a bunch of older brothers that, uh, and I spent a lot of time out back behind the shed getting my business handed to me. And he goes, I don't think we'll be going back there for a while. It's just, it's a, it was a very hard, hard life, but you know, he had a drink and he can say he played in the National Hockey League and scored a couple of goals, you know? And, uh, you know, I look back, that was an incredible accomplishment because no one expected it except him. I was a mess. I didn't really know what was going to take place. I had trouble finding employment, uh, did a lot of odd jobs, you know, been good with my hands, etc. And uh, again, who comes to the rescue but Floyd? And uh, <clears throat> says, I want you to go see a guy down at Belleville, Mav. Stop in for a coffee, shoot the breeze with him, see what happens. I said, well, what do you mean? He says, Louie, you got, you know, you played a long time and you got something to offer the game. Go see what Matt has to say. So I did. Louie's a smart guy. Um, he knows how to get the best out of a kid. He knows how to, if a kid is fidgety, because uh, that's kind of the way he was, a little bit of um, a late bloomer, um, distracted uh, so uh, he sees potential he's very good at at uh, noticing um, what each kid has to offer and and he'll uh, he'll get that out of a kid and he knows how to do it and I think he's a tremendous coach because he has the passion and that passion is what separates uh, the good from the great. If you worked hard for Louis and gave it all you had and were willing to go through the wall, he'd back you to the, to the bitter end. I treated everybody as family. They were, you know, no input is not good with me, you know. I like every part of input, in, uh, uh, good things and bad things, and filter it out. So that was the freedom that we had, and I, I thought that was a great uh, part of uh, the success that we had that really didn't get noticed. I thought they had a really good shot to win. The only team that really worried me was the London Knights because they had these massive monsters back on defense. 
which, uh, you know, they were hard to crack. Four or five of the boys were involved, uh, you know, Louis, as you said, as head, as head coach, and then Mike was scouting, and, and Floyd was obviously overseeing the, the scouting operation. So for, from a standpoint of, of being a sports reporter, whose beat was the Bulls, it was just incredible fun because you just felt like uh, you knew those guys so well from having grown up here that it was almost like uh, being part of the family. And uh, it was like a family team, and Belleville was the extended family. And it really had that feeling coming to the rink those nights. Uh, it just felt like, hey, uh, the Crawfords are running a team, but we're the rest of the family in an extended version. And who's coming to town that is going to try and beat the Bulls tonight? And you really did have that feeling. The Bulls got up 3-1 to one in the final over London, and I wrote a column suggesting that they were going to finish it off on, in Game 5 here. And uh, I guaranteed a victory. And I don't know what I was doing guaranteeing a victory sitting in my chair. <laughs> well, those guys. So anyway, of course, they lost Game 5. And then they go to London, and London wins Game 6. So we're back here for Game 7. And, uh, but I remember after Game 6, and I traveled with the team in those days, and uh, I got on the bus, and I was sitting next to Louie, and he goes, he had never said anything about the column. Very quiet about it. And then he, he kind of, so now all of a sudden the series is tied, coming back here, Game 7, winner take all. And he goes, uh, why would you write that column? And I said, geez, Louie, I just was convinced you were going to win. And he goes, so was I. <laughs> and he said, but didn't you think they'd wallpaper their dressing room with that guarantee? And I go, yeah, I guess so. And then I, I thought this was great. Louis just kind of said, maybe I should have wallpapered ours with it. And, and that's all. He never said it again. I was extremely proud of what they did. And when they won uh, the uh, Ontario Championship, and then they went on to the Memorial Cup and came with an eyelash of winning that. Raises the cup and draws perhaps the loudest cheer. They just want to say, look, Dad, this, and Mom, this, this is what we did, you know? We did what we set out to do, which was win the championship here for, for Belleville again. For the first time in their 18-year history, the Belleville Bulls stand alone above all others in the Ontario Hockey League as the OHL champions. Todd is he's an amazing athlete, um, great runner. And, and uh, you know, as an NHL player, I used to thought I would think I was in excellent shape. And I remember coming home, I was about 22 or 23 years old. And, you know, I, I kind of led the... Uh, the Canucks at uh, their training camp runs and then I always prided myself on being a really good conditioned guy and was a cross-country runner at high school in Nicholson and a whole bit. I came home one summer and ran with Todd and I was like oh my god this guy's at a different level. I wanted to be a hockey player, I'm not gonna lie to you, almost every kid that you grew up uh, here in Belleville or anywhere in Canada that has ever had a stick in their hand wanted to be a hockey player. But I realized it fairly quick that I wasn't going to be on that same path. So uh, I, I always knew that uh, I wanted to do something. I wanted to make an impact and it was really important for me to, to find something that I was really good at. I always remember watching Todd train at BCI and I don't know if you remember but uh, on the one side of the building they had they jerry-rigged a uh, long jump pit using the sidewalk which was you know nowadays that's ridiculous but, but Todd would work out and his runway was the sidewalk, and then they, it would veer off, and they had the pit. And uh, you know, he went on to get a track scholarship at Drake University, and it started on that goofy sidewalk, you know, between BCI and, the, and that little cemetery there, the angle, uh, the side of the church. Lucky enough to have the genes of uh, a sprinter and a long jumper, and I ended up getting a Division One scholarship, um, NCAA Division One scholarship to the United States, and uh, had a very, very successful career in, in, in the United States and uh, I won a few conference championships. Todd was very vocal. He hated to lose. Still does. Uh, loves to win. And I always kind of had my father's um, uh, accomplishment as my goal to win a world championship or, 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 or to get to the Olympics. That would be really something neat. And I ended up doing both. After track and field was over I got into bobsled. It's a perfect sport that you can transfer in without too much uh, prior knowledge and uh, I ended up making the national team my first year. Um, went to five different world championships and I went to one Olympics and uh, won a world championship in 1997. So that was uh, probably the highlight of my athletic career.
I was not a girly girl, did not want to do a whole lot of things um, that the other girls did. I was always out playing road hockey, and so I played many different sports and um, went to a lot of games uh, um, to watch my brother. I guess to describe Danielle is that uh, she was an athlete on her own. I mean, she was a great athlete. Baseball, soccer. She still plays soccer today, and quite competitive against you know twenty year olds. And, uh, hockey. Uh, she was involved in sports, and basically all I can say about Danielle is uh, you know she's learned the competitive uh, edge also, and she not only does it uh, in the uh, field of sports, she instills a lot of what Pauline had where she used her brains. The guys always told me if girls hockey had been more developed as it is now when Danielle was a kid, probably would have played for the national women's team. And boy, you want to talk about competitive. Uh, she's as competitive as any of the boys in that family. I uh, definitely wasn't uh, into wearing the dresses and whatnot. But um, yeah, there was, um, I guess, I've just heard the stories. Like, you know, when I came home, they were more or less, it's. It's a girl. The stories that I heard was that they had always planned to have eight children. Oh, okay. So where the ninth one popped up, I don't know. Eric's 12 years younger than I, and I was in grade seven when he was born. My sister had gone away to university at uh, Ottawa U and uh, came home one day, and we were, you know, I was a young te teenager. I was 14 or 15. She said, take it easy on mom. And like, um, take it easy on mom. Like you know, you start to break away from what they're what they're telling you at that age. You know, I'm going to hang around with my friends. You know that kind of stuff. And um, well, what do you mean? Well, just be. She's pregnant. And I went pregnant. You got to be kidding, right? Like nobody gets pregnant at that age, right? I think it was probably a great blessing for our family. Um, because Eric is a lot younger than everybody else. And uh, I, th I think in a funny sort of way, it taught us all a little bit of responsibility because all of us had to babysit. All of us had to um, really take care of him uh, in some way, shape or form. He was a gifted uh, hockey player. He was small. He had a fiery Irish gene. Uh, um, he he played with a ton of passion. Um, he played bigger than his physical stature. And I remember him vividly playing for the Dukes. And he was a tiny guy. And, and, uh, and nowadays, uh, they probably would uh, um, suspend you for many games. But Eric used to go, oh, I would say two or three feet off the ground to hammer somebody into the boards. And it was fun to watch him do it. And if he got uh, like a charging penalty for it, he was totally upset because it wasn't charging, it was just the way he checked. I didn't have to look far to, for heroes, right? Um, I watched them play. I watched them all the way growing up, minor hockey into junior hockey in Cornwall or Kitchener or in Trenton or wherever with the Bobcats, um, and then go on to, to play in, in the professional ranks, whether it be at the American League or the NHL. And, and uh, you know, Certainly everyday kids don't get that opportunity, right? I think it was hockey's in their blood and it and it's Hard to get that out and coaching after your playing career coaching is the next move There's a lot of trying to impart your knowledge and help somebody else and There's part of trying to convince somebody that they can do something and uh, You know, I always felt that both my parents were uh, were really good at, at at those sorts of things. It was sort of natural for him to be able to talk to kids, and I think like you see it every day, right? So you 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 pick up on on that uh, uh, on that sort of teaching um, acumen. A lot of good teachers inspire, uh, but they also direct, and uh, uh, sometimes they motivate, and sometimes they just organize. And uh, I think those are all qualities that you need to be to be a good coach. I think they coach because they want to share the wealth. They enjoy it. They they still they want to get in into the aspect of sport 
any way they can. I guess we've inherited um, some angel genes, and we want to help. Sometimes we help um, too much. I don't know if there's such a thing as helping too much. We get, we get so emotionally involved in any person that we've, we've invested an effort into. So we, w we want to see it through right to the end. We had those lessons early, and I think that they stay with you. And they become a fabric of, uh, of who you become. I don't care where you win a championship at. It is the absolute best feeling uh, that you're ever going to have because you know that you've set a goal, uh, you've worked towards getting to that goal, and when you finally reach that pinnacle and you win it and you are the best, there's no feeling like it in the world. People that are, that are champions, they walk a little... They walk a little straighter, they walk a little taller, um, they have a presence about them um, that, you know, is, is uh, it's special, right? And to have, to have that uh, legacy passed on from my father to his children, and hopefully it'll pass on to another generation from there, I think, you know, if you want to trace back where the genesis is from, I would say it would probably be from there. You know, winning begets winning. There's something about those guys, and, you know, Again, with the most, utmost respect, not many of them were the best player on their team. Um, but as the, as the stakes went up, as the ante increased, they had another gear. None of us had. We have a mutant gene that some, sometimes gets fired up, but that's just passion. Um, uh, that we all want to compete, we want to win. We always wanted to show mom and dad that uh, not to be proud of us for what you know we do, and I, I think that had a lot to do with Floyd winning that championship here along with his uh, teammates. Uh, and I know I wanted to do that. I wanted to you know, perform well and say, "Look, dad, look what I did. Look, mom, look what I did." Looking back on it now, I mean, there was a tremendous amount of talent in Belleville, um, and I think a lot of that has to do with. Uh, you know, the McFarlands and the interest with them and all of those guys gave back to the uh, minor hockey program in the community. They would, they would put on clinics, I mean, uh, and they'd coach. And so we got a little bit of an unfair advantage over some of the other cities around us. There's hundreds, hundreds of guys uh, from my generation who've grown up uh, and had the Crawford influence. Floyd uh, and, and guys that um, were with the McFarlands, they stayed with the game and they coached kids too and, and shared their expertise. Without that foundation of, of a championship city and putting Belleville on the world map of hockey back in 1958 and 1959, who knows? Uh, all of a sudden, years later, Belleville was a viable site for a Tier 2 team. And then all of a sudden, Belleville was a viable site for an OHL team. I think it starts with those families, the Crawfords, the Hulls before them, uh, and the Maharas too. I've always been extremely proud of all of my brothers and sisters both with whatever they've accomplished. And that just doesn't go for sports, that goes for everything. We didn't think we were exceptional really uh, because uh, we, you know, it was just, you know, that was us, that was our family. Going on trips together, um, just going to sporting events together. Um, where's your brother? Where's your sister? You know, just keep watching out for each other kind of thing. Um, that part has kept us together through thick or thin. And um, family is a, a, a big part of us. They were well behaved. It, uh, you know, I know it sounds like a corny term, but uh, and it goes back to the discipline Floyd probably had at home. You know, but, uh, we can't give you everything, guys. Uh, you're gonna have to work for certain things in life, and uh, that's the way they did it. That's just the way we grew up. It's, yeah, we recognize that we're unique, but nobody's kind of I don't think ever forgot where they came from. You know, nobody has a huge ego. We're all proud of each other, but, you know, um, it's just the way it is. All those guys, just ordinary guys, and I think that's one of the things, and the brothers and that, if you meet them, they, they, they appreciate everything. That's, that's what I liked about them. It used to bother me that people would say, oh, you're Crawford, right? And say, no, I'm Bob Crawford. Well, as I'm older and wiser now, you know, I'm a Crawford, I'm from Belleville. And, um, 
extremely proud of that.